Good morning. And we greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're uh, so happy to have uh, you with us today to uh, witness the ordination of our brother Paul Anderson, the Patriarch Evangelist. And so we welcome all the family and friends and uh, loved ones that are here and those that are joining via the live stream. We trust that the Spirit of God will touch your soul this day and express His truth to you. I'd like to read for a call to worship from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9 through 13. Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is the same also who ascended up into heaven to glorify him who reigneth over all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we, in the unity of the faith, all come to the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let us uh, turn on our hymnal to number eight. We will stand to sing this, number eight, and remain standing for the opening prayer by Brother Roland Moeller. God, worthy is thy name, all pressing praise and honor be to thee. O Lord, we invite your spirit to be with us and ask in the name of Jesus Christ that we each might be touched to learn more of you. I also pray that your angels might be in our midst to comfort and calm us, to help us to understand the love that you have for us. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, this morning we're going to witness uh, a man's life changing once again in response to the Lord's call and... Uh, and when you respond to the Lord, it usually entails some cost of some form or fashion. 
And as a priesthood minister, that usually comes in time. Time out of your life, uh, maybe a change of direction in your life. And the scriptures say, greater love hath no man than to lay down his life for his brother. And of course, we know that Jesus laid down his physical life. He was crucified and resurrected on the cross. And that scripture is in reference to some of that in Christ's life. And I praise the Lord that he did that for us. But sometimes for us, the laying down of our life is a change of direction. It's maybe not taking a promotion that would take you away from home as much or uh, move you to a different part of the country, take you away from a place where the Lord needs you to serve because there's, there's no one there to serve his people. And so the laying down of our life is uh, something for each of us to consider when we have decisions to make in our life. And so the laying down of our life is an offering. We come to church and we take up an offering because we have to pay to have the air conditioners running and sometimes we have to pay to get them fixed and sometimes we have to pay to replace them because they wear out. Or maybe it's the heater or the water pipes or the lights or whatever. But the Lord provides. The Lord provides for his people, whether it's physically or spiritually. And we make a choice in our offering to the Lord. So today, as we take up an offering of basket comes, and we're going to put some money in it to pay some bills. But what I'd really like for you to consider and think about is your offering of your life to the Lord. Because that's the most important thing you can give, is of your life. Brother Jim, would you come forward and I'll ask the Lord to bless this offering we make this morning. Father in heaven, we pause once again, which is not nearly enough, to acknowledge the countless blessings of life you pour out upon us in so many different ways, in so many different times and places, and through so many different people. And so, Father, all I can say is thank you. I ask, Father, in the name of Jesus, that as this offering is collected this morning, not only would you bless the money in the baskets that it would accomplish more than seemingly possible, but that you bless the hearts of each and every one with inspiration of your desires for our service, and then magnify that service to you, Father, that it may bring a fullness of glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
We'll remain seated and turn in our hymnal to number 225, number 225, The Church is One Foundation. Good morning. Good, morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Welcome you all here to the sanctuary in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's so good to see familiar faces. It's so good to see family. Thank you so much for being here today and the Andersons back there make a pretty good looking group of people and we appreciate that. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> Paul said that's okay. All right. Well, we come here today, and uh, this morning I uh, was awakened early, and I uh, got up and stirred around and got some of the things that I have to do to wake myself up, and get kind of on track and so I I thought I'm just gonna set out on my front porch on Dan's front porch and um, just kind of sit with the Lord for he asked me to be still and know that he is God and so I was compelled to spend that time this morning so I I went out Ryland I went out there and I set in an old rocking chair and I looked out across and it was such a beautiful cool morning and a nice breeze which I attribute to the Holy Spirit was abiding with me in my quiet time there and so lo and behold watching I was drawn to a movement uh, over in a little area and uh, 
there was a young uh, fawn that stepped out of the woods there and the mother doe stepped out soon after staying pretty close to her because that fawn was fairly new into this world. And so I watched them for a few minutes and and um, then the doe, I was trying to stay very quiet and the doe recognized something different over where I was sitting and so she decided that she probably better move her young fawn off away so they went up around the barn at Dan's and so I appreciated so much of seeing new life a family life of creation and so then just a short time later out stepped two more fawns they were a little older and the mother was behind them and I could tell that she had a little bit of anxiety because these guys were not still at all. They were anxiously engaged in a beautiful morning. And so they kicked up their heels and they romped and played and just were having a marvelous, marvelous time with the beauty of the morning. Well, the mother, I guess, recognized me too. <laughs> and um, she whistled and boy I mean they shot back up the hill and uh, they too went around north behind the building up there but the birds were out the hummingbirds were flying they were coming in and feeding and God is good God is good and he presents us with marvelous creations to share with us that we might have joy. And so I thank that for a joyful morning and yet as I saw you all gathering in again, my day is turning out to be very joyful and I thank you for this time. I would like to read a little bit this morning out of uh, the 45th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. We come here today in quite a cross-section of people. Cross-section of churches. But yet, you see, in my heart, in spending time with the Lord, um, I'm coming to realize his one church because what he has told us has he not brother Richard that the day will be where there will be two churches one of darkness and one of the light of Jesus Christ the Lamb of God and I come to you today to say, I have that feeling right here in this house, right here today, and with my brothers up front here, that we are of one body. For I truly believe that the blood of Jesus Christ flows through each one of us, and we are brothers and sisters together, one family, one family. And um, thank you, Kathy, for playing that song as the deer during the uh, offertory. That is such a wonderful hymn to me. So um, section 45, I think, speaks to us of this day. And it speaks of why we're here today. So I'll start reading. Hearken, O ye my people, O ye people of my church, to whom the kingdom has been given. Hearken ye and give ear to him who laid the foundation of the earth, who made the heavens and all the hosts thereof, and by whom all things were made which live, move, and have being. 
I witnessed that this morning with God. And again, I say, hearken unto my voice, lest death shall overtake you in the hour when ye think not. The summer shall be past, and the harvest ended, and your souls not saved. Listen to him who is the advocate with your father, who is pleading your cause before him, saying, Father, behold the sufferings and the death of him who did no sin, and whom thou wast well pleased. Behold the blood of my son, which was shed, the blood of him, who thou gavest that myself might be glorified. Wherefore, Father, spare these, that my brethren, that believe on my name, that they may come unto me and have everlasting life. Hearken, O ye people of my church, and ye elders, listen together and hear my voice. While it is called today, harden not your hearts. For verily I say unto you that I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the light and the life of the world. A light that shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. I came unto my own, and my own received me not, but unto as many as received me gave I power to do many miracles, and to become the sons of God, even unto them that believed on my name, gave I power to obtain eternal life. And even so I have sent mine everlasting covenant into the world to be a light to the world and to be a standard for my people and for the Gentiles to seek it and be a messenger before my face to prepare the way before me. Wherefore come ye unto it, and with him that cometh I will reason as with men in days of old, and I will show unto you my strong reasoning. Wherefore hearken ye together, let me show it unto you, even my wisdom, the wisdom of him who ye say is the God of Enoch and his brethren who were separated from the earth and were received unto myself a city reserved until a day of righteousness shall come. We come today to um, witness an ordinance within the church. An ordinance that has been set in place from the restoring of the church back in the 1830s. And the Lord placed his church within the bounds to serve all people. All people who would come and hear and believe. And through this Today, we will um, hear witness, we will hear testimony of uh, our brother Paul Anderson and his call to be set apart as a patriarch evangelist. Holding the office of high priest. Um, my witness of this is that uh, about two and a half years ago in um, a Tuesday morning discussion we were talking around our table and um, Paul was teaching something that he had brought forth from a class that he's been attending. And I asked the Lord about that. And the Lord witnessed unto me that I was hearing a father of the church. And that um, 
in due course of time with testimony that he would um, through his willingness to serve the Lord which he has most of the days of his life having grown up in a godly family and having a father that um, through the witness of Brother Paul was also a father of the church and taught many people of Jesus Christ. He taught many people of the truth. And our brother Paul, that's what Paul seeks, is the truth in this the latter day. And so with that, with brother Andy, I asked uh, him about this calling and Brother Andy prayed, and we got together, and uh, Andy brought confirmation of a witness of Paul's calling to Patriarch, Patriarch Evangelist. And so with that, other people have come to me and, and ask if that was the case, that Brother Paul would be... Uh, a patriarch someday. That day is here. And it is for the pleasure of our Heavenly Father that this is coming about today. And so I pray in your hearts that you will lend yourself to hear the Holy Spirit and feel that in your heart which is truth. And as you hear the truth, see the workings of God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit in this day. This is a great day, and I thank each of you for being here. It's a pleasure to be with you. I met Paul a couple of weeks ago and uh, have had just a few minutes to speak with him. But um, Brother Woody asked me to, to share the testimony and I'd like to do that. Um, the circumstances surrounding my um, patriarchal blessing uh, have been a, an anchor to my soul through all of these years. Back in 1968-69, um, uh, in the summer, uh, right before school started, I was down in Texas right before my junior year in high school and um, I went to a camp that was absolutely amazing at Cienito. Um, we had uh, about 80 people there and this particular camp they came and they were there because they wanted to walk with the Lord. I'd been to other camps previously where the main thing seemed to be that people wanted to raid the cabins and raid the kitchen and do mischief and all of those kinds of things. But this one was different. We got together on the first day and with a couple of cabins and said, what can we do? Can we fast? Can we pray? Can we, what can we do to make this something of worth? And um, I won't tell you all about the camp, but Brother Al Sheehy was there and uh, some of you remem may remember him. He was a little short guy. I was already six, two or three at the time. And uh, so he taught me that when I have a difference with somebody, I need to sit down and talk to them, not tower over them, because um, I had a difference about something with him. But um, at the end of that camp, 
uh, well, it was it was just a marvelous experience. But at the end of the camp, he arose on on our final service and he spoke to us under the influence of spirit. And he called me by name, and he told me about some of the surprises that were going to happen in my life. And he said, "I want to call your attention to your patriarchal blessing." And in it, you'll find three things that will be important for your ministry um, as, a, as a minister, as a husband, and as a father. And um, I was thrilled that, you know, the Lord had spoken to me, but I didn't really understand why that should happen. But at the end of that summer, we moved up to Independence, Missouri, we, um, I went to William Chrisman High School that, uh, in my junior year. We lived right next to the groves. There used to be a, uh, a house that was, had stairs up the, up the middle of the drive going up the hill. The house isn't there anymore, but it's just, just to the um, uh, east of, of, of the groves. And, um, um, and there were a lot of a lot of things happening in my life, some troubling things. Things happened in the church. There was my father was a, a seventy, and uh, a lot of the appointees were let go, particularly the more conservative types. And I was sure my dad was going to be next. And and um, I read the position papers that year and. And um, there was, and I started dating, and that was a disaster. And because um, I, because I never knew what to say at all. Um, and um, anyway, that's that's irrelevant to this to today. But um, uh, a lot of things were happening, and I was uh, sitting at home, uh, feeling like the world was coming down on my shoulders, and I was going to cry, and I told my mom I was going out for a walk and she said fine and I got my coat it was terribly cold I remember it was October November and I started walking down Truman Road and as I walked the Lord's Spirit engulfed me and he reminded me that not two months before he had called me by name and told me about those things that were going to happen and um So at the end of the year, I did go uh, to get my patriarchal blessing. And right now, I was trying to recall the name of the patriarch, and I, it's one of those things that's just whooshed away here. But, um, but I remember what he said. And um, there were things that he told me about studying the scriptures, about certain scriptures that... Um, were important and as I say that has been a an anchor to my soul for all of these years through all of the difficulties through all of the turmoil and everything and when I was called to be a patriarch um, I was terrified of giving a patriarchal blessing <laughs> How could I stand in the stead of the Lord and, uh, and minister to someone in that way that he had ministered to me? And um, I, the first few that I gave, I, I would fast for at least three days and, uh, ahead and, and um, pray. And then I went to Belize and, and I had to give like, Ten of them in seven days, <laughs> and so it it kind of kind of uh, made it so I couldn't couldn't give quite that much preparation to it. But uh, I've 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 been learning. I've been trying to learn to to depend on the Lord for for those for those kinds of things. And um, the most unusual one probably that I gave um, I was in Tahiti. And a Mormon elder asked me for a patriarchal blessing. Now, that was not that was not something that that I had <laughs> had even considered might ever happen. But 
saying he's a Mormon elder, I'll give you a little bit of background. He was a, uh, he grew up RLDS. And when the, um, when the homosexuality and the women in the priesthood and all of that came in, and it was, it was done quite early in, in Tahiti. And uh, he and his wife um, separated from the, from the community of Christ and, um, and wandered around and finally ended up in the Mormon church. And he was, you know, immediately uh, up the ladder, was, became a Mormon elder. Uh, he had been a priest in the RLDS church. Um, he became a Mormon elder. His, his wife had a calling to help with families, and she loved it and, and um, was quite content there. But um, he had on his wall a picture with Wally B. Smith, Every Graffio, and about 50 of the um, native pastors there um, in, that were you know, RLDS, and, uh, and, and they said, if, if we had just had a place to meet, we, we never would have done anything different. He said, in my heart, I'm an I'm a RLDS. And so I, pr I said, well, I'll have to pray about that. And so I prayed about it, and as I prayed, uh, the only thing that came to my mind was freely you have received, freely give. And in the morning when I woke, I looked out the window and there was the most beautiful rainbow right outside my window. And uh, it occurred to me that for those who, who understand it's a symbol of the everlasting covenant, for everybody else it's just a blessing. And uh, I felt like the Lord was saying, you can give a blessing, be a blessing. One of the things that has been most uh, encouraging to me is that the call to be a patriarch is just to be a blessing. And to be a blessing to his children, wherever you find them. And so um, that's the part of the experience that I've had. And it's... Um, it's a, it's a blessing to be here with you today and to share in this, in this ordination. And I believe that it will bring a blessing to the Lord's people. Brother Paul's going to share his testimony to this call with us now. look out across the company that's here today I'm grateful for every one of you I want each and every one of you to know that to a person every soul plays no small part in my gratitude for this day and for the uh, opportunity to serve that's been extended to me my mind goes back and it goes back very briefly to a service that occurred in this building in 1996 in which I was an instrument of hurt to many people and I'm not going to dwell on that day because that day is gone and forgiveness have taken place on levels that I'm not aware of wasn't aware until I came back from my stay in prison and I realized that the Lord had been working not only with me but with everybody that had been a part of my life I haven't been this anxious folks since the day I defended my master's thesis in college at Oklahoma State University 50 years ago this month I am anxious this day in spite of what the apostles told us not to do. Don't be anxious about nothing. Because I know the weight of what is going to take place this day, and it draws me to the weight of the experiences that I've had. 
I've known about this call for 18 years. Of an experience I had in Sandstone at a BOP prison there 18 years ago. I've not shared it with anybody outside of a group I meet with every Friday. I told them about it last Friday because we had a member that was in our group, and I thought that that would make meaningful my testimony. But there was a lot of dissension and fighting going on with my case, and I was placed in a facility that had one Jewish inmate, and he was a pain in the side of everybody up there. He stood up for his religious freedoms and his rights to the BOP, the administration, and they had to cater to him for feasts and for, you know, traditional things that the Jewish people recognized. And he had a mouth on him that delivered meta colorful metaphors on a daily basis. It was hard to understand how a man could speak the way he spoke and believe the way he said he believed. And he was a problem to everybody he got around. And the BOP and their wisdom and their fight with me from again the nature of my case, which I'm not gonna go into, it doesn't matter, was to put us together in preferred housing to where we'd have to be in the same cell with each other in hopes of creating an argument to where new charges could be bought on one or both of us and or good time taken away from us. That was the reason they did it. And we got together and shared a little bit day to day. And eventually, he asked me if he mind if he read some of the Torah to me before we go to sleep. And I said, no, not at all. If you don't mind if I read a little to you, I had my scriptures right there that I studied. And, and that particular night, I had absolutely poured my hat, heart out to the Lord because I was at the end of my thinking. So what in the world is the purpose in all this? What do you want me to do? Here, what am I supposed to do? And he... Uh, read his little read, and I read mine, put my book over by the sink, getting ready for bed, and he shared a story about a, a rabbi that taught him, and maybe you've heard it before, but I'd never heard it till then, but he said, you know, Paul, I hear you guys talk about a kind and a gracious Heavenly Father, a kind and a gracious Jesus. A rabbi told me one time that kindness gives to another. Compassion sees no other and that kind of feathered in with everything that i was studying in my life at the time and the fact that you've heard me say before there's only one of us here and i love every one of you so much family church family and friends my goal is really simple in this life it's the one day here this guy named jesus Roll the words off his mouth that Paul Anderson was a friend of mine. It's all I want to hear. Nothing else matters to me. Because as our conversation went on, the light of the moon came around and put a light right over on my book that I was sitting over there on the sink. And this guy looked at me and he says, Hey, Paul, I think you got a message. I said, What are you talking about? I said, Look over there. There's my book lit up. And I go over, and there's 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, just jumping off the page at me. Be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. That wasn't anything new to me. I had to watch out what was going on all because it was after me, seemingly. And it says, do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of your ministry. And my first question was, here? This setting, I'm supposed to do that here? 
And then he told me about this man, this young man that was crazy for Jesus that he'd met in another institution that bore such a testimony of Jesus. He said, I can't believe we get along the way we do, Paul, because nobody else gets along with me. But this guy got along with me too. A guy named David Herabedian. And you can imagine where the conversation went from there when he floated that name out in the universe of our cell. I didn't know David at the time, but I knew Tom and Sue, and David to this day praises the power of a mother's prayer in the salvation of his soul and his ministry that he has now putting Bibles and his testimony in a book called Jet Ride to Hell, Journey to Freedom. It shares the movement that Christ had in his life. And I knew right then that God knew exactly where I was at. And the things that we were experiencing, my family and I, they were part of a plan that I did not understand. I say that today because I see the struggle of our people. And there was an effort made to involve others in this program today for the sake of putting forth a novel belief that we accept your ministry, period, because your authority didn't come from an organization. It came from the same place mine did. And I have a testimony of mine. And whether you believe it or not, it's mine. And I do believe it. And I believe in yours. The way I feel right now is very simple. I can recall some phone calls. I got to call home every night because my wife sent me money. I could buy telephone time, and we could talk for 10 minutes. And that time was spread out over four daughters and Peg and whoever happened to be there at that time, a couple of minutes apiece. And on three different times, she said, well, this daughter, this daughter, this has something they need to talk to you about. Now, three different times, I was told, Dad, I'm pregnant. And I could feel the pain in her voice and the disappointment and the embarrassment. And the only thing that crossed my mind was, God, I wish I was there just to put my arm around them and try somehow to make them feel that they could not do anything that would make me not love them. And I realized that's exactly what God was doing to me every day I was away from them. He was just wanting me to crawl up there on his lap, just like that picture in the living room of my house of a little child sitting up on there, just at ease and contented, knowing love was there. I wanted them to feel that love. I have no other agenda. I've waited as long as I've waited for this to happen because of some agreement I thought held weight between me and the God to just keep this whole thing on the low low 18 years ago that happened and just kind of be between you and me, Dad, and we just kind of ride through life and be grateful. But he wants a little more from me, and I am compelled because of the love that he has made me aware of to try, to try and do my best in his name. There's a lot of stories I could tell you. I know there's been a lot of prayers for me and my family, and this day I request those prayers to continue if you don't mind. 
We need them. I need them. I'm going into a stage of life, a physical side of it, that I don't understand. But I know two years ago I could do anything I wanted to, and now I can't do anything. Because, well, the only story I can share with you that'll tell you my belief on this was a little girl that was part of a deaf school and a man come in one morning and wrote on the board how come God made me able to talk and hear and made you deaf that's not the, really the kind of question I'd expect a teacher to come in and write on a board for a bunch of five six year olds that's a pretty heavy question and apparently this one little girl came up tears down her eyes tongues quivering a little bit of lips took the chalk out of the man's hand over on the board she wrote yes father for this is your good pleasure oh to know my daddy like that what a blessing it would be she knew who her father was and she knew she never left his presence she never left his heart and that's the message I want to share with God's children, my brothers and sisters. I love music, probably because of the singing we did 40 miles one way to church and back year after year after year down in Oklahoma. This is one of my standard books. I read them, sing them daily because I find in here words of battle that someone was having and the victory that was achieved. And I would leave with you this idea is what I would want to leave in the hearts and minds of every one of you. These words, those of you who are part of the reorganization, the restoration, I don't know how widely used this song is, but you'll recognize the words. I think they encapsulate, I love the economy of words that this offers. Unto God, who knows our every weakness. With faith, we lift our hearts in prayer. Asking in humility and meekness for his love, his direction, and his care. Though the task be great that lies before us, we trust in one divinely strong, knowing well at last we will be victorious. We'll pray that the time will not be long. Lord, accept the humble consecration of our lives and our talents to thy cause till thy word is preached in every nation and all men have a knowledge of your laws what else is there to drive your life towards than that ending praise and honor and glory to our God our Creator, whom first love we have abandoned and we need to rediscover. We need to be able to share with everyone we meet the presence of love in our life. And without it, how tragic this would be, this whole world. There would be nothing to live for. Nothing. Love is all there is. Everything else is just that. It's everything else. I pray this day, as I know many of you, maybe all of you do, that we honor our Lord and Savior, our Heavenly Father who came to this world and gave us an example of any hope we'd ever have. I want those who know me to see that hope. A lot of them won't listen, but I'd rather see a sermon anyway, wouldn't you? 
enough is said behind this microphone. Not enough is seen outside these walls. I want to experience the joy and the friendship of my Lord in everything in my life. And I am so grateful for the opportunity to love back and to extend that love which has been shown to my family by everybody in this church this day. Thank you all. Praise our Lord and Savior. Bless the name of Jesus. Turn in our hymnals to number 232. We'll remain seated to sing this. Number 232. Our kind, all loving Heavenly Father, we humbly approach our throne of grace this morning to thank Thee, Father, for the many blessings of life that You give to us every day. For Thou art an awful, awesome God, the Creator of the heavens and the earth and all things therein. Hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we come this morning from different groups and within the Restoration, and yet we recognize that we still are one through Christ our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray this morning as we come to this service of uh, ordination to evangelist based right for Brother Paul, we pray that truly your Holy Spirit might be here at rest for Brother Woody as he shall confirm that, uh, uh, offer that prayer of, of ordination. And we pray that Brother Paul might receive the guidance and the strength and the service he needs from day to day to carry on that duty and responsibility that he might truly be a father to the church in this part of your vineyard. And so once again, Father, we thank thee and praise thee, and ask all things in the holy and worthy name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul, if you'd take the chair, please. Brother Jack, Brother Ron, Brother Woody. Heavenly Father, we place our hands upon thy son, Paul Anderson. For Father, this holy ordinance, that of ordaining our brother 
to serve you in the calling of a father, even a patriarch evangelist at this time. That, O oh Lord, as has been stated this morning, that in and of his blessing and the setting apart to this office, Father, he would be a blessing to all those he comes in contact with, that in and of his own very countenance, he would witness of you and the love of God the Father. For there stands great need in this day, in the hastening times. And with that, O Lord, we pray for his strength. His life has been prepared, even in the heavens, when he was spiritually born. For your record of heaven and your kingdom was impressed upon his soul at that creation. And with that, Lord, may he carry that love that was given to him at that time into all the souls that you place before him, that he would counsel them in truth and in that truth the spirit of love not fear but love that in his very words he would take those upon his lap as you do O father and heal their broken spirits that just by his presence in the room, peace would abide. So Lord, at this time, we pray and ask and bestow this blessing upon our brother Paul, and may it be sealed in the heavens above for his service unto thee. And we ask this, in the holy, blessed name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whom we trust. Amen. Paul briefly referenced a day that occurred in this building in 1996, and I want to keep my reference brief as well. Some of you in this building were here and witnessed it, participated in it, whatever you want to call it. It was not a good day. But today is another step in the redemption of that day. You see, every day is an opportunity to learn. Some days we make mistakes. Some days we make really bad mistakes. In the moment, we think we're doing the right thing. By God, I am going to stand up for the truth if I'm the only one standing for it. And then later we find out, well, eh, maybe that wasn't the time or maybe I didn't understand or whatever. Paul and I were on opposite sides of the issue that day. And there was a time in my life I didn't much care if I ever saw Paul again or not. And then the Lord began to work with me through some situations, and Paul has shared that he went through some situations. 
And I hope that other people that were in that room, that this room that day, have gone through some things with the Lord as well. Praise the Lord. He moved in everybody's life that we were able to come together and put that day where it needed to be put between us anyway and move forward with the Lord. Everything we go through is an opportunity to learn. It's our choice how we respond to it. And I'm so thankful that the Lord worked in our lives the way he has and to bring this moment to this day. We're going to turn in our hymnal. We're going to stand and sing hymn number 237. 237. After we sing this, we will remain standing for a closing prayer. Brother Jerry Metner, I'm going to put you on the spot. I apologize for that, but would you please come forward and offer the closing prayer? Thank you, sir. 237. Heavenly Father, whose love is as large as your power and your power as large as your love, we thank you, Father, for that which has transpired this day in the hearts and minds of your people assembled here. We recognize that you go way beyond us in so many ways to create and to make your work valid. There are so many needs and so few laborers against the numbers 
that are out in the world. 325,000 showing up every day. 150,000 returning to your presence. What a marvelous capacity, Father, you have dealing with your children in a personal way with each one of us. We only ask to be worthy of your leadings that we might come to you in our needs as the words of the hymn that Paul read unto you who knows our every weakness we do come to you in prayer we ask you to bless the lives of each one here in additional ways that we might feast upon your word that we might grow in the likeness of your son so that there is greater capacity to love bless the men behind me on this rostrum that their ministry might be one of significance because the needs are so many and so great but we are called not to be discouraged to take it to you in prayer and you will strengthen us to answer the call we ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.